Greetings, Portage First United Methodist Church. This is Pastor Michael Lawson coming to you on our very special Christ the King Sunday. Uh, many of you are probably already at this very moment participating in our silent auction, benefiting the Upper Room Recovery Center. We're so honored that you would do so. It's such an important, important ministry in the life of our community. So many are, are struggling with the disease of addiction, and it's nice to know that our church is taking a hand in transforming lives and helping people recover. A few other announcements before we begin. Um, our Advent Bible study will be beginning Monday, November 30th. It's called Christmas in the Four Gospel Homes, and you can purchase a book for $8, or if you, if you can't afford that, just let us know. We'll give you a book for free. It's fine. Um, it just helps us offset a little bit of the cost. Call the church office, and we'll have a book set aside for you. Um, I'm going to do two sections of this, Monday, November 30th at 6.30, and then, t and then Wednesdays at noon. So the first one will be November 30th. The, the second one will be December 2nd on Wednesday. Um, a few other announcements. Uh, we would like to remind you that we're continuing with our community meals. This week they're doing a, a Thanksgiving dinner to go. So if you'd like to participate, please contact the church office or Deb Rossell. I know that they can always use more volunteers. We do practice social distancing and wear masks, so just know that you'll be safe. Guess what? It's angel tree time. The angel tree is up and out in the narthex of our church. It looks stunning thanks to the efforts of our two Christmas elves, Connie King and Robin Wilkening please consider sharing love at Christmas with a local child who may otherwise not be receiving a gift this year. We hope you'll stop by the church um, Monday through Thursday during the church's open hours from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. to pick out an angel. Each angel has the age, gender of a local child, their sizes, uh, favorite color, and ideas for a gift they might like to receive. There's also a number for your angel. Please remember to write the name and phone number, your name and phone number next to the angel's number on the sheet of paper next to the table, next to the tree. Gifts should be returned, wrapped, or unwrapped with the angel attached to it and placed under the tree by December 10th. Um, thank you, church, for so very much. If you're not able to come to the church, but you'd still like to participate in the Angel Tree Project, please contact the church office. Um, we'll, we'll set up an angel for you and, and give you instructions on how to do that um, through the church office if you, if you need us to. Beyond that, I hope that all of you find yourselves well today, and let's begin our, with our call to worship directly from the Psalms. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is God who made us. We belong to God. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving. Enter the courts with praise. Give thanks to God. Bless God's holy name. For the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever and God's faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Thank you. 
Jesus' name. Cornerstone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of Won't you pray with me? Gracious Lord, you are indeed our cornerstone, that strength that the whole building, the whole foundation of our life rests upon. Gracious one, we ask your presence with us today as we focus in our prayers today for those dealing with the disease of addiction. We pray specifically for the Upper Room Recovery Center, praying that, uh, that it will uh, benefit from our auction today, but also, Lord, that you will continue to bless them, that lives would be transformed. We pray for the many clients and patients in recovery centers all over the United States who are fighting tooth and nail to overcome their addictions. Gracious one, we ask you right now to give them strength and perseverance in what is a very, very long road. And we pray for all those in our congregation and all those attached to our, to, for all those in the families of our congregation that are struggling with this disease right now. We pray for all those that are stuck in, 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 in addiction, that are trying to overcome, or maybe at this point are not and are just well, overwhelmed in their addiction, God. We pray that you'll lead them to freedom and to victory and to well-being and health. In Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. Our scripture text today comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. Paul writes these words. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayer. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly place, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet 
and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of God for the people of God. How do we find you today? How are you feeling? Perhaps you find yourself, like me, disappointed that yet again we are in virtual worship and not meeting face to face. Perhaps you find yourself overwhelmed and disappointed and sad at the, at the result of our national elections. Perhaps you find yourself um, overwhelmed with sickness or illness or disease. Perhaps you find yourself fatigued by the continual uh, struggle we're having against COVID-19. Perhaps you find yourself joyful this week. Perhaps you got that promotion you were hoping for. How do we find you today? What's life like for you? Is your family in conflict? Do you find yourself sad that your Thanksgiving celebration will look different this year? Did someone, some face that you were hoping would be at the table, have they left you this year because of death or just can't be there because of COVID-19 restrictions? How do we find you today? How are you? Perhaps you find yourself some mixture of darkness and light. The reality is that is how most of us are most of the time. We find ourselves if one area of our life is going well, then another area of our life is, is falling apart. And, and we find ourselves stuck in this middle ground between, between good and evil and right and wrong and the way things should be and the way things are and what we want and what we don't want. And we find ourselves um, trying, to, fe trying to, to make sense of the world and, and to order everything back together and to pull everything back into alignment at all times and in all places. And it is truly, truly exhausting. Today, as we came upon the story of Christ the King Sunday, when we celebrate the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, I found myself thinking all week long about the, the, the marvelous work of the Sistine Chapel, the, the ceiling that Michelangelo painted. And what's interesting to me about that entire story is that Michelangelo, um, was, at the time when he started the chapel, he was actually not known for his work in fresco. Fresco is actually a very difficult medium to work in. Basically what happens is they take pigments and they mix it in with the plaster and through a chemical process and curing, the plastic actually dries and it is stronger and as strong as marble by the time it's done. But it's such a persnickety process that if you don't do it exactly right, it will, it, the, the colors will fade within hours of drying and it will become just this dark, muddy sort of, sort of thing. And the only way to fix it is to chip it all off, which is backbreaking and exhausting work. And so Michelangelo, known for his remarkable work in architecture and statuary, he's put up for the job of painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And so he goes in for the job because one of his rivals wanted to see him fail. One of his rivals wanted to see him fail and therefore ruin Michelangelo's name all throughout Rome. And so Michelangelo said, well, I'll do it. I'll try. And so wouldn't you know it, he starts on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which, by the way, is not one of the bigger chapels in Christendom, although its importance is, is magnificent in, in, our, in our lives. You know, if, you, if you've been to the Vatican and it's it, the, the huge halls and the huge worship spaces, the Sistine Chapel is actually relatively small it, by comparison. Now, keep in mind, it's still pretty huge, but it's the Vatican, and so it's, it's actually one of the smaller spaces, but it's magnifying in importance because that's where the new pope is chosen. And frankly, I don't care if you're Roman Catholic, you're Lutheran, you're Methodist, you're Presbyterian, who the next pope is is always an interesting process. I mean, can you just imagine any other system in which a, a chimney, a smoking chimney, is so, so riveting and so interesting? I mean, do you remember the last time it happened? You know, the CNN's doing some story about some council meeting in Albuquerque, and down at the bottom of the screen is this little picture of a chimney where we're constantly watching. And I remember being in seminary one day when, when, uh, when Benedict XVI was chosen, and I was sitting there, and I was, I, was, I was there home for lunch, and I was eating my lunch, and all of a sudden my roommate ran in and said, it's time, it's time, and we flipped over to the news channel to see the bells ringing outside the Vatican, and I was late to work that day because I, I had to watch it and see what happened next. And that the idea of, of, of all of that is, is connected to this little chapel. So its importance, even though it's not one of the grander spaces, its importance is, high, is highly connected so they're having Michelangelo rise to the occasion of painting that Sistine Chapel ceiling. One of my favorite quotes from, from Michelangelo, I didn't put it in the first one, but I'm going to put it in this one, was just after he completed the Sistine Chapel, he said, I'm tired and my back hurts. 
The reality of the Sistine Chapel is that when he first started, he, took, he, he did panels all the way through Christian history, and he starts at the, at the beginning, and what he should have started with was Adam and Eve, but instead he decided to do something that he considered easier, so he did Noah's Ark. Right as you walk in the door, right as you come in the door of the Sistine Chapel, you can look straight up, and the first little picture that they have is of, the, is of uh, the Noah and the Ark, and then after that is Adam and Eve. But he did the Noah's Ark because he thought it would be easier, and wouldn't you know it, he finished the first, the first panel, and he finished, and wouldn't you know it, he did it wrong. And so pretty soon, um, it started to fade within hours, of its, within hours of its creation, and so he had nothing to do but to break it all down, take it all off the ceiling, and start again. A failure. He began with a failure. And the reality is, um, his, this is exactly what his rivals were hoping for. Michelangelo's name had risen to the very, height of, uh, the very height of Christian architecture and art at this point, and people were really jealous of him and really wanted to see him fail. But he, he did manage to get it done, and then he created all of these frescoes, and then he created um, figures and angels all around the chapel. And then at the, at the chapel wall, at the very front of the chapel, he drew his depiction and he painted his depiction of the final judgment and the return of Jesus. Oh, and he did so many controversial things with it. Jesus is pictured without a beard. Oh my, how shocking. But Jesus is pictured without a beard in the visage of a young man, not an older gentleman, but a young man. And surrounding him are angels that are setting up the pillars of heaven and around him are, are martyrs and down near the bottom, right about where we would put our praise team. Sorry about this, guys. But right over there where we would put our praise team, um, that on that side of the chapel, he drew pictures of sinners being led down into hell to, with the demons and, and all of them going on to their eternal punishment. And among them, by the way, he painted the rival who put him up for the job. So he put him down there being led down into hell. But what al what's also interesting is that around Jesus were pictures and paintings of the martyrs, of certain martyrs. And, and the reality is um, they were holding in their hands um, different Im instruments with which they were martyred. So uh, one of them uh, was one of them's holding a pair of tongs because it said that he, he was, his heart was taken out by tongs and placed on a fire. And so he's holding these fiery tongs. And, and oftentimes um, in depictions of the saints who are martyred, they often do this. They put some sort of image with them that shows... That, it lets you know who they are. So mm, St. Catherine, for instance, was, was crucified on a wheel, so she's often shown holding a wheel. And one of the saints that's depicted just below Jesus, just on his right-hand side, is uh, a saint by the name of St. Bartholomew. And history or le legend tells us that St. Bartholomew was flayed. He had his skin removed from him. And so there is St. Bartholomew, and he's holding his skin, ready to drop it into the pit of hell. Now, Michelangelo did this. All the, saint, all the martyrs are ready to drop these, these instruments of their torture down into hell because he was trying to show that now that Jesus has returned, the time of suffering and pain is over, and now the age of joy and light is ready to begin, ready to be inaugurated. But what I find so interesting about this depiction, about this picture of St. Bartholomew, is that as St. Bartholomew is ready to drop his skin down into hell, it doesn't look like him. The skin doesn't match the, the person who's holding it. And what is interesting about this particular thing is that the skin that he's ready to drop into hell is a self-portrait of the artist, Michelangelo himself. Michelangelo was burdened by the fact that he did not believe himself worthy of Christ. He did not believe himself worthy of his gift of artistry. He did not believe himself to be a person who was in the running for heaven. In fact, he it said that during his work on the Sistine Chapel, he felt more and more hopeless as he depicted the final judgment because he realized he just wasn't good enough. He wasn't up to snuff. He wasn't going to be one of those people and who was going to be living in the joys of heaven. And so he depicted himself skinless, fle boneless, fleshless, just nothing left but a bag of skin ready to be dropped into hell. And that's how he saw himself. That's what he believed about himself. Today, we hear a story, we, hear, we celebrate the return of Jesus, a doctrine that has been so mightily abused, is so, so incredibly mishandled, that Christians nowadays look upon the return of Jesus with fear and trembling for the first time in our history. And yet, in the ancient world, 
for, for, for century after century, Christian people looked upon the book of Revelation, they looked upon the return of Jesus with great and marvelous hope. But for some reason, we have so abused it with our doctrines of, of, of quote unquote, the rapture where everyone loses their clothes and flies up into heaven before being taken away before the great tribulation or this one historical figure that they're talking about called the Antichrist and how he's going to, we're all going to have to have the 666 put on our foreheads and these horrible abuses of the book of Revelation, these horrible, horrible um, theological messes. You know, there are things in Christianity, there are things about the Christian church that I do not know for sure, but one thing I know, that theological stream, the Tim LaHaye, the, Jen the Jenkins, the Schofield, these are people who have abused the Bible and it has damaged the church and damaged our view of Revelation and damaged how we do business on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the, I can tell you with 100% certainty that they are wrong in what they have done to Scripture. They have literally raped the book of Revelation and left it in tatters. What I want you to know this very day is that the book of Revelation was written for the, from the standpoint of bolstering a church that was being led, that was being in tribulation at that very moment. Christian people were being martyred and killed en masse. It was a, it was a matter of law in the, Ro in the Roman Empire at this time that Christian people were to be put to death. They were suffering, they were struggling, they were being fed to lions. The great, the great emperor Nero was, was in Rome and he, he didn't like Christian people. He didn't, he, he didn't approve of their lives. And believe it or not, um, Nero is actually named in the book of Revelation. 666 is actually a number that coincides with the letters in Nero's name. And so he's actually named as the person who's, who's mentioned as an antichrist. And the story of Revelation is a story of John, the, John who wrote the gospel of, of St. John, John the Revelator, John the beloved disciple of Jesus. He is writing this book to give strength and hope to a church that is facing incredible pain and suffering. And he recognized the fact that there will be charismatic leaders who are antichrists, who lead the church away from its message, who lead the church into periods of persecution and suffering. He recognized the fact that there would not be one antichrist, there would be an antichrist for every age, that, the, 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 that in these moments the church would need to remember its message of hope, and the message is that Jesus is, going, that Jesus is still in control, that Jesus is still king, and Jesus will see the church through its difficult and strugglesome times. Note here in our passage of, of Ephesians, what does he say? He says, I pray that God that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. The hope to which he has called you. If revelation is as it has been, as it has been treated in books like the Left Behind series or Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth, if the book of Re Revelation is supposed to be understood that, th that way, what hope is there truly? What hope is there but a future of torment where God himself comes down and extracts pain from people as, as punishment for being human? What is it but damaging, damaging theology that, that, that hurts the church's hopeful witness? The reality of Revelation is that it was meant to be a message that gave hope to its people. Hope in the midst of a moment when they had an antichrist that was causing them pain and suffering. And Nero was not the first, and Nero would not be the last. Because after Nero, a few more years later comes Diocletian. Diocletian, who hated Christians to such a degree, he often nailed them to crosses, painted them with tar, and set them on fire to light the streets at night. These are the kinds of suffering that the church would face generation after generation. These are the moments that we would face and, and still face all over the world, Christian people still being martyred, and the book of Revelation was meant to give them hope and to let them know that even though it is bad right now, God is still in control. And even unto the modern age, we have had our modern day, we've even had our, our modern day antichrist. If you think about the ministry, ministry is the wrong word, well, work, the work of Hitler in his age, what did he do? But he deceived the church and led them on a pathway of hatred and, and disgust and disgusting and, 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 and 
dehumanizing slaughter. And this moment, and, and, and this man was an antichrist, and he, he misabused the German church, and he misabused people, and pretty soon their Christianity came second to what he was prescribing for them. Antichrists will come, says Revelation. They will deceive many, and many will hold fast to the faith and be persecuted for it. But whatever comes, Jesus is still king. Jesus is still in control. And the reality is, the book of Revelation gives a very complicated vision of, of hope. You know, earlier this week, I did something terrible. I was talking to someone, and they were telling me how disappointed they were. This is a small, Im small image, but they were telling me how disappointed they were that their kids wouldn't be able to come home for Thanksgiving because of COVID, and how disappointed they were, and how much they cried. And in my well-meaning thought, here's what I said. I said, oh, well, you know, it'll be okay. We'll, we'll be fine. You know, you, we, we'll, we'll make it better next year. And all of a sudden it hit me, that does not, that does, I did not connect with the pain that this person was feeling. And I said, you know what? You know what? Nope, that's not right. That's not right at all. I said, actually, what you're telling, I hate that for you. I really do. I hate, the, I hate that feeling. I'm sorry you are feeling sad. Rather than just mull it over or say something placating, Revelation does this with hope. It says, yes, it is painful. Yes, it hurts. Yes, we live in a world that is filled with pain. We live in a world that has suffering in it, but God is still in control. Revelation insists on hope, even when hope is fleeting, even when hope is hard to come by. Revelation insists on hope. Remember what Paul said in that prayer again, I give you a spirit of wisdom, may God give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that your eyes may be enlightened, not downcast, not brokenhearted, but enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, the hope, the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believed, according to the working of his great power. The promise of revelation, the promise of the return of Jesus is not one of suffering and death and pain, but one of re remarkable and immutable hope in the midst of death and suffering and pain. The reality of revelation, the reality of Christ the King Sunday is that we promise, that the promise of God tells us that, we will be, that God will, 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 will return and will change and will transform and turn our suffering into life. I started by talking to you today about Michelangelo's uh, Sistine Chapel. And what I want to talk to you now is about what he did after. After he finished putting together that ceiling, after he finished the backbreaking effort, he started working on a new statue, a grave marker for his own grave. And in that grave marker, he did a, one, a very common theme for him. He actually did another statue of this called the Pietas. Well, he also, he was from Florence, Italy originally, and so he went to Florence and he created a, a grave marker for himself. People think that at this point he knew that his health had been damaged by his work and that he was possibly, that he was in his dying process. So he started working again on a new pietas, a new picture of Mary receiving the broken body of Jesus. And in this, he placed four figures. Mary is the central figure, and she is grieving her son who is in her lap. And beside Mary, on her left-hand side, is Mary Magdalene. Now, already at this point, Mary Magdalene's reputation in the church had been damaged by the idea that she was a prostitute. You will not find that in the Bible. That was actually a part of tradition. For many years, the Christian church could not conceive of a woman. that She either had to be virginal or pure, or she had to be a prostitute, and there was ne'er, ne'er the, ne'er, nothing in between. Um, that was how the church viewed women, and I'm sorry about that, and they've repented since then, and even the Vatican will tell you Mary Magdalene, there's no evidence that she was ever a prostitute, it's just a story that people told, but already by the time that, uh, that Michelangelo made this depiction of her, she already had this stain upon her character, and so the, the central figure is Jesus, on, the dead Jesus on the lap of Mary, and to her left is Mary Magdalene, now, in that day and age, because of the damage to her reputation, many times Mary Magdalene would not be depicted close to the Virgin. She may be in the same frame, the same picture, the same statue, but never close. And in this picture, Mary Magdalene is helping Mary hold Jesus in her lap. Behind them is a male figure, the picture of Joseph of Arimathea, the man who gave Jesus his own tomb for Jesus' body to be placed in. 
And there he is, and it's a beautiful picture. It's actually a very beautiful, beautiful statue. And the picture of, of and Joseph of Arimathea looks very placid and, and very peaceful and that he's, he's doing a very important work. The, the picture on his face is, is one of, of, of resignation, that suffering has come, and, and now he will help Mary face it. But what is interesting about this statue of Joseph of Arimathea, what is important for us to note about it, is that it is also a self-portrait of the artist. That somehow, in fighting with his demons upon those chapel walls, somehow, in painting those frescoes and doing that work, Somehow, when he looked at the broken body of Jesus, he found the wholeness that he had been missing before. That while at one moment he considered himself just an empty bag of skin ready to be dropped into hell, in the broken body of Jesus, he found hope for himself. And so he made himself whole. He made a sculpture of himself as a whole and complete person. And the only hope that he had was in the broken body and passion of Jesus. This is the message of the gospel. This is the message that we're supposed to live in. That we have hope because of what Jesus has done. That Jesus provides us hope for a future. That Jesus is paving the way for a transformation of the world that brings, it, that brings us an end to all of our suffering and grief. I always ask myself when I hear people talk about God in ways that, that make us afraid of turning to God or, or, or pour shame upon people for their sinfulness. The reality is Jesus doesn't seem to do that himself. Jesus recognizes that there are sinners all around him, and yet Jesus tends to get angry only when people are oppressing other people. Jesus gets mad at the Pharisees and the Sadducees for what they're doing to, the, to, his, to his countrymen. But when Jesus is confronted with a sinner, what does he do but he sits down and eats with them? Do you think, do you think that the message of the gospel is this, that God came all the way down from heaven into earth to exist in one place at one time, and experience the frailties of human life, and then suffer on the cross, and then be resurrected. Do you think God went to all that trouble just so he can be mean to you? Do you think that God would do all of that just so he could get, just so he could smite you? Do you think that God would go through all that pain and suffering just to make you suffer more? That's not a message of hope. That's not the message of the gospel. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that, your eyes, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, and you may know what is hope, the, the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what, are, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power. This is the hope with which we live. This is the hope in which we breathe. This is the hope in which we have our being. Indeed, the message of the gospel is all about hopeful. And so on this Christ the King Sunday, when we will face, when we already know, if we aren't already facing antichrists in the, in the future, people who will deceive the church, people who will deceive us, people who will lead us down, to, to, on, down evil paths and to do evil things, when we recognize that we live in an age just like they did in the first century where things were uncertain and scary, doesn't it stand to reason that we, we should remember that in the same way Jesus redeemed and transformed and changed back then, he will do so now. The Bible wants us to live in hope and to fight against the evils of the world. And into that hopeful message, we live, we breathe, and we have our being. Amen. Peace and shalom. Dear brothers and sisters, the time has come for the giving of our tithes and offerings. And we invite all of you um, to use push pay today, or perhaps you'd like to mail in your offering or even bring it to the church office during our office hours. You are welcome. But we also invite you to give of yourself this wonderful day. Give God your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. Share with God all that you are and pour before God the, 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 the deep parts of your soul. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we come to you today asking that you consecrate this offering of ourselves, asking that you make us holy even as you are holy. Sanctify us, Lord, that we may be your ambassadors to the entire world. May we live in hope and share that hope with others. Amen.
And now may God, whose infinite mercy, walk with you each and every day. May you go in peace to love and serve the Lord, and may you be blessed in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.